I want to see you To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Praise and worship team, lead us in one more song of praise and worship, and then immediately following, we're going to have our Pastor Jeffrey Centron come to um, give us some spiritual food, the Word of God, this morning. Praise God. In this time of desperation. When all we know is doubt and fear. Come on, help me, everybody. There is only one foundation. We believe. We believe. In this broken generation. When all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation. We believe. We believe. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. songs we sing and in our weakness and temptation we believe we believe Father God, we believe in you. Believe. Hallelujah. Thank Hallelujah. you, God. Yeah. Thank you, God. We're going to sing that one more time. We believe. Hallelujah. Woo. Yes, Lord. In this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt, and fear glory to God hallelujah there is only one foundation come on sing it with us yeah. we believe we believe in this 
broken generation. Yes, Lord. When all is dark, you help us see. Yes, Lord. There is only one salvation. We believe. We believe. you to this house today and we ask that you may take your place as the head of this church father that every word that proceeds out of my mouth may be led by your holy spirit but most of all father lord god that your word may be like a double-edged sword that it may cut coming in and cut coming out father i pray for wisdom wisdom to lead the people that you have made me responsible for Wisdom in decisions, wisdom in our walk, wisdom in any planification that we may have, wisdom to minister, Father Lord God, those that are brokenhearted, those that are heavy laden, those, Father Lord God, that are bound, and, and Father Lord God, whose yokes are heavy. Wisdom, Father Lord God, so that you may be glorified. That Potter's House Church may not just be another church, on another corner in a city, but that we may be, Father Lord God, a lighthouse to the surrounding area, that those in darkness may see this place as a place of refuge, that they see this place that if they're hungry, that they will be fed, that if they're thirsty, they will get water to drink, that water that stirs in us like a river, that we may be planted, Father, in that place, and be nourished by your holy word. Father, I feel your presence this morning, and I just thank you. I just thank you for being such a good God. I thank you, Father Lord God, for loving me, for loving us when we don't deserve it. Father, I thank you, Father Lord God, for your son, Jesus Christ, who received the lashings on his body, who received nails to his hands and to his feet, who received a, cro a, a crown of thorns upon his head. Father, I thank you for that love that you shared with us on that cross, for the blood that you poured out for the redemption of our sins. And Father, we just want to say we th we're thankful. 
We're thankful because we rose up this morning. We're thankful because we're in the sanctuary. We're thankful, Father, Lord God, because we can praise you openly. We can praise you freely. Father, we can say hallelujah. We can say amen. We can say hosanna because we love you, Father, and we thank you. I thank you, Father, Lord God. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to read a story that we're all familiar with. And today we're going to be talking about facing your giants. Facing your giants. I want to talk about facing your giants, and I want to hopefully give you a different perspective on the story of David and Goliath. We often hear about this young shepherd boy with five smooth stones facing a giant. I just want to take some time to read some scripture because you will see here that he just wasn't any small shepherd boy. Starting at verse 45 through verse 49, we're going to be reading the Lord's word. Amen? And the word of the Lord is already blessed, and it says as follows. It says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver, deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I give the carcasses of the camps of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was... When the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistines. I want to read that part again. David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistines. Then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank in, into his head and he fell on his face to the earth. Amen. You may take your seats. I want to talk about facing your giants. But I want to ask you a question or make a statement before a question. Before you can face a giant, you got to identify who he is. Before you can face a giant, you must identify who he is. Because we already know what the scripture says, we do not fight no, against flesh or blood, but against principalities and governors and authorities of the heavens. But in that fight, there's someone that you have to address directly. It's funny because I was watching a, 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 a video, a movie, and they said... Oftentimes, what people don't understand is that they're so busy fighting the people around them 
versus going straight to the leader that's causing the conflict. So we have to find who is the strong man, who is the Goliath, who is the giant in your life. It can be your emotions. It can be your marriage. It can be your children. It can be your finances. It can be anything that's causing you to not be like David. There's a key here, and I read the verse twice on purpose. David never ran away from a fight. David, brother Emilio, did not run away from the giant. He ran to the giant. He went to the problem. He confronted the problem face to face. You see, but too many people, when the problem comes, they become cowards. And you see, the crazy thing is that according to stature, the person that had the physique and the position to fight Goliath was King Saul. The Bible declares that King Saul towered above his people. In other words, he was so tall that he looked over them. He had the armor. Because if you read the story, he took his armor off and he put it on David. And David said, wait a minute, I can't use your armor because I haven't proofed it. What does that mean? That means is that sometimes we want to fight our giants with other people's armor. I'll put it in another way. We want to fight the giant, but we want other people to pray for us when we need to be praying for ourselves. We want other people to pray and fast, but we need to pray and fast. Who is your giant? Put a name on your giant. So the question that I have is, who is your giant? And are you willing to confront your giant face to face? Are you going to be valiant enough to confront your giant and run to the problem instead of running away from the problem? Because as Christians, we cannot afford to turn our backs on the enemy. I'll say that again. As Christians, we cannot afford to turn our backs on the enemy. And we have many Christians that turn their back on the enemy and say, the Lord will help me. Well, yes, the Lord will help you, but you need to take the step forward. I have not seen a war or read of a war that is won by taking a step backwards. And David here, it doesn't say he walked. He ran. He went to the problem, not away from the problem. And it's interesting to me because everyone was prepared to fight him with a sword and with a shield. And David just took five smooth Stones. He didn't just take any stones. He took five smooth stones. I don't know if you're into numbers in the Bible. I'm into numbers in the Bible. But number five represents grace. Five is the number of grace. So I like to say, this is not what it says, but this is just Pastor Jeff imagining, right? It's just, it's just me imagining, saying, I like to imagine that he put a little bit of God's grace in, in, in his purse. And that when he went to battle, he said, I know that God's grace is sufficient for me to overcome any giant that I am 
uh, that I am confronting. How do I know this? Because even the apostle Paul had a thorn on his side that he asked God, deliver me from this thorn. And he said, my grace is sufficient. So a lot of times we think we don't have what we need to beat our giants, and God is telling you, you have my grace, and my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. It's interesting because people were upset with David. David's brothers were upset that he came to see what was going on. So I'm here to tell you that when you go to face your giants, sometimes people are going to get upset because you take the initiative of running to the giant instead of running away from the giant. Because we have a lot of church people that were like David's brother and King Saul. We have a lot of spectators watching the enemy defile God while we stay quiet. We have a lot of people that are standing to see and asking God, what do we do when they already know what to do? There's nothing worse than a Christian that knows what they're supposed to do, but because of their stubbornness, or as the Bible says, because they're stiff-necked people, they don't go and face the giant. Who's your giant? What's its name? What's his strategy? What are you waiting for? Because his grace is sufficient. His grace is enough. You don't need somebody else to partner up with you. David did not need somebody to hold his hand into the battlefield. David just needed his grace to stand on the battlefield and run to the giant and defeat the giant. His grace was sufficient. My question to you is, are you facing your giant? A giant can be your insecurities. A giant can be that forgiveness that you think you have, but you haven't truly given it. A, gi a giant can be that bitterness that you're holding in your heart from a past hurt and that you praise God with, but you realize that you can't truly serve God until you've let everything go. We talk about, on Tuesdays, we talk about forgiveness and we talk about bitterness. And we talk about all these things. But one thing that I understand about forgiveness and bitterness is that as long as you're not willing to face that hurt, that hurt will continue to manipulate you in your life. So if your giant is, is, is not forgiving, let's face that giant. Let's confront that hurt. Let's confront that bitterness. Let's confront those things that are keeping you from being who you're supposed to be in God. Because it does you no good to come here every Sunday and listen to the messages, but you don't actually apply it and understand that God's faith is enough for you to overcome whatever obstacle, whatever giant, whatever the enemy throws at you, his grace is sufficient. It's funny because... When you look at the story of David and Goliath, if you keep reading later on, Saul, King Saul says, but who is that young lad? Who's that young lad? Who is he, that straggly shepherd? And you see, to, to add a little bit more insult, his brothers say, well, who did you leave those little bit of sheep that you have with? See, because the enemy will intimidate you by telling you your deficiencies. 
by telling you you're too small, by telling you you're not ready, by telling you you're not prepared, by telling you you're not educated enough, by telling you you haven't prayed enough, by telling you you can't do this because the enemy is too strong. And it's interesting to me that David said, I, it's like I can just imagine this. It's mind-blowing, right? It's the pff factor, right? It's like David's like, okay, I'm small. I'm, I'm, I'm a straggly kid. Uh, I have a little bit of sheep. I look like a shepherd. I smell like a shepherd. I'm not a rich man. He actually tells King Saul later on in the story when the, um, he gives his, uh, uh, King Saul gives his daughter for marriage. He says, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a man of, of little resources. And, 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 and you understand it would be an honor to be, to be the, the king's son-in-law, but I'm, I'm a nobody. But David understood that although he was a nobody, he knew somebody. He was a nobody that knew somebody. He was a nobody who served somebody. He was a nobody that believed in somebody. He was a nobody that praised to somebody. He was a nobody that got destined to shepherd sheep isolated him so he learned how to speak to God by himself, separated him from his father and his brothers so that he would not be contaminated with negative and garbage in his mind. It was to the point where his father almost didn't even recognize him as a son because if you listen to the story, it says that after King Saul uh, 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 turned his back on God, that God said, I have selected a man after my own heart. Go to so-and-so's house. And it says that, 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 that Samuel went to the house and the man presented his sons. And, and, and Samuel's like, oh, this guy looks handsome. He's tall. He's strong. He got muscles. Don't get excited, ladies, right? Because not everything that's big and strong and has muscles is of God. Okay? Just, just in case, just in case. Not everything, not, you, know, no, you know, he may have a big chest, but he might have a big head too. You know what I'm saying? He, 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 might, be, he might have a lot of money, but he might be the meanest guy you'll ever meet. He, he, he might look on the, on the outside, but he might have worms on the inside. So, so, so you got to be careful that what you don't let yourself go by what you see. And Samuel looked at this guy and was like, man, he's big, he's strong, he's handsome. This is him. And God said, eh, wrong answer. So sisters, don't be upset when God goes, eh, don't touch. Leave it alone. Don't even put it on layaway. See, because some of y'all put it on layaway. You make a deposit today and then go back tomorrow. I don't know why I said that, but just leave it alone. <laughs> leave it alone. Then he goes to the next son. Eh, wrong one. And this continues on several times. And David, I mean, and Samuel knows God sent them there. And he had to ask the guy. The guy didn't say, oh, by the way, I have another one. No, no. He had to ask God, wait a minute, do you, do, you, do, you, do you have any more children? I mean, I know I counted seven, but do you have another one? He's like, yeah, I have a, a straggly boy attending sheep that smells like the outside. Right? You know, the ones that the sisters don't want to look at, but that's the one that God has called them to be with. But because he doesn't look like the one that she asked for, he doesn't, he doesn't talk like the one that he wanted for, she doesn't have the money. Like, why am I talking about this this morning? Now, somebody must be looking for the wrong thing in this house, and God's telling you, you better stop looking at the muscles and start looking at the heart. So I don't know who's that for, but you better grab it. God's trying to get you out of trouble. And he said, he said, I got, I got that shraggly boy with string bean arms and string bean legs. 
stinking like outside. You ever smell somebody when they come from the outside? They're like, ooh, they smell like the outside. You ever, right? You ever have that, right? You ever have that? Right? I'm so glad that, 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 that God gave my wife his eyes. Yeah, I'm glad because I know that she was looking for a nice, handsome man, right? She got a little chubby guy. But I'm just glad that God put love in her heart for me, right? So, so maybe she didn't get the muscles she wanted, right? But she, got, but she got the best of the best because that's what God selected for her. And God selected her for me. She got a teddy bear. That's right. That's right. We're going to snuggle up. <laughs> I love you, baby. <laughs> so David comes into the picture. And I could just imagine Samuel, Brother Emilio, like, this? This is, this is what you got? This right here? See, what we don't understand is God doesn't need a whole lot to make things work. <laughs> God only needs a heart that's willing. Because when your heart is willing, the body will follow. When your heart gets right with God, there is no limit in your life. I didn't say there won't be obstacles. I said there's no limits. Understand the difference. When your heart lines up with God, you understand that although I'm walking alone, I am not alone. Right? That's why I can be a person that's by myself. I can eat by myself. I can watch a movie by myself. And people may think that's crazy, but it doesn't bother me because if you're not comfortable being by yourself with God, then you'll never be comfortable when you're by yourself in a battle. I'll say that again. If you're not comfortable being by yourself with God, then you won't be comfortable when you're by yourself in the battle. Because there's some battles, Brother Scott, that I can't help you with. All I can do is stand there and watch. I can pray for you. I can cheer you on. But there are some races that you're going to have to finish. And whether you crawl across or whether you run across, the important thing is that you get across. Oh, no. That you finish. Yeah. And there are giants in your life that are keeping you from finishing what God has called you to do. Some people in this church are asking God, why am I not where you told me I was going to be? And the answer is, you're running from your giants. You're not confronting the hurt. You're not confronting the situation. You're not confronting and honoring me, understanding that you only need me. You don't need a man. You don't need a woman. You just need me. Certain battles are nobody's business. There are battles we're going through that are nobody's business, and it has to be just you, the giant, and God. You, the giant, and God. That's it. Not you, the giant, and the pastor. Not you, the giant, and your husband. Not you, the giant, and your wife. Not you, the giant, and your children. Not you, the giant, and the church. Just you the giant, and God. That's it. You need to understand that facing your giants requires you to be fit. Huh? What are you talking about, Pastor? <laughs> Pastor, you a little chunky. I know I'm chunky. But I'm talking about spiritually fit. But not just spiritually fit, sister. See, because we got some spiritually fit people, but some weak-minded people. We got people that are strong in the spirit, but they're weak-minded. 
They can't, they can't take correction. They can't take guidance. They can't take consultation. They can't take advice. And they can't take the word of God when God touches the womb. You have to be spiritually fit, but more than ever, you have to be emotionally fit. Your emotions have to be conditioned for the battle and the atmosphere and the environment that you're getting ready to go in. Can I tell you something? If you can't handle the little petty stuff that happens in the church, you can't handle what the devil has outside for you. If you can't handle the stuff in the church, you can't handle what the devil has outside for you. I'm going to say it a third time. If you can't handle the mess in the church, you're not going to handle the mess outside. And we got some messy Christians. Messy in church. Messy at home, messy in their marriage, messy with their loved ones, messy with their family, just messy. And they want to talk about faith, and they want to talk about grace, and they want to talk about mountains, and they want to talk about forgiveness, and they want to talk about how God has done great things. Don't talk to me about God doing great things until you first fix your mess. I'm glad we have one sister that clapped for that. Because when you face your giants, that's when, that's when the mess comes out. Oh, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you missed it then. You missed the story. Or maybe you haven't read the story. You see, when the giant came out, the intentions of Saul's heart came out. He was in a position of a king, but he wasn't fit to be a king because his mind and his heart and his spirit were not conditioned to faith a Goliath. And a lot of times we have people in positions that their mind ain't right, their heart ain't right, they're messy leaders, and guess what? They're not fit, uh, fit to fight the giants. Pastor, you stepping on toes. Okay, I'm going to step on them a little bit more. You better not be wearing Nikes. Look at the person next to you and tell them, don't be a messy Christian. Ooh, they, they got offended. Tell the other person, don't be a messy Christian. <laughs> don't be a messy Christian. Scott wanted to tell my wife, but he's like, I don't know how to say that in Spanish, so I'll leave it alone. <laughs> don't be a messy Christian. Because when you face your giants, that's when you know if you're ready. Can I tell you that? Because Saul was okay fighting as long as it wasn't a giant. I'll say that again. He was okay fighting as long as it wasn't a giant. Why are you so scared of fighting a giant? Just a question. Why are you scared of fighting a giant? Is it the armor? Is it the voice that torments you when you're laying down, when you're by yourself? Is it the negativity? What is calling you not to run to the enemy and causing you to run away from the enemy. The scripture tells us that we are more than conquerors, but you can't conquer nothing if you're running away. The scripture tells us we are more than conquerors, and you can't conquer nothing if you're running away. Think about that. Think about all the battles you have ran from because you were scared to run to that giant. Hmm. 
Think about the amount of people that leave church because they don't want to confront a giant. Think about that. And I, and I ask you that question because we are at a stage at Potter's house where we are called to face giants, not run away from giants. You see, because if you allow one Philistine in your camp, eventually you're going to have a whole bunch of Philistines in your camp. You know, it was funny because I was talking to Pastor Israel, and we were talking about King Saul. And when Samuel came, he gave him a whole bunch of excuses. God's instructions were, kill everything. Kill the men, the women, the children, the livestock, the chicken, the cows, the horses. Kill everything. <laughs> I, 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 I don't have trouble understanding the scriptures, but I, un, I almost am compassionate with, 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 with King Saul because I can understand that he's like, man, but this is a good horse. But man, this, this is a lot of chickens. We can eat some Kentucky tonight. Okay? But, but, but wow, these women look beautiful. I can see Saul thinking about that. But Saul got blinded with his emotional and physical state and not with God's sovereignty. Because God's sovereignty understood you have to eliminate everything so that it no longer becomes an issue in your life. There are giants in your life because you don't want to kill off everything that's associated with it. And if it's a relationship, it might be a family member, it might be a friend, a co-worker, that God is saying, I need you to cut it off. You can love them, but you better love them at a distance, and you love them at a distance because you can't afford to receive the poison and the infection that's in their heart to come and contaminate your camp. And when Samuel shows up, he hears the animals. He hears the people. And he tells Saul, oh Saul, what have you done? He's like, but I saw the horses and I saw this and, and I just saved the best for God. For, for, for God. See, that's the excuse a lot of us do. Well, but, but God told me, and, and I'm doing it for God. No, you better check yourself at the door. Don't collect $100. Sit down and really ask yourself, is God telling you that? Because God will never go against his word. God won't tell you, God won't tell you today this and then tell you something different tomorrow. God does not change his heart. I mean, he changes his mind. And we have a lot of Christians, and I think we talked about this yesterday, where God told me, God told me I was going to do this. But then when things get hard, they go back to what they were doing. Oh, no, God told me to just to stay here. Then, then, then that wasn't God. Because when God tells you to do something, he prepares you, he makes you comp competent, he makes you confident, he will call you, he will equip you, he will guide you, and he will give you what you need to overcome and to accomplish what he told you you were going to do. Do you guys think it's easy to stand up here? Yeah, because you see, a lot of people look at the pastor and they look at him, oh, he just preaches on Sunday. But what about the hell that he goes through the other six days? What about the complaints and the murmuring that he hears the rest of the days? People got quiet. But I thank God I don't have none of those in, 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 in Potter's house, right? We don't have none of those. <laughs> the point that I'm trying to make is that we have to really be sure 
of who we are, whose we are, and what we are in order to fight a giant. And when Samuel came and he said, what have you done? He says, well, I'm just, it's just an offering for God. God doesn't want you to offer him disobedience. He wants you to offer him obedience. Ooh, I'll say that again. He wants you to offer him obedience, not disobedience. In fact, Samuel says, God prefers obedience over sacrifice. And he goes on and he says that disobedience is like witchcraft. Think about that. Disobedience is like witchcraft. You cannot slay your giant if you're continually dealing in witchcraft. If you're continually being disobedient. If you're continually staying in the place God has told you to move from. Isn't it funny or isn't it ironic that when the cloud moved in the desert, the people of Israel moved? If it was nighttime, if the fire moved, the people moved. But this is the people when it comes time to face the giants. See, you don't realize that when God tells you to move, it's because he's positioning you. He's positioning you to be in the right place at the right time. God can bless you everywhere, but he won't bless you anywhere. I'll say that again. God can bless you everywhere, but he won't bless you anywhere. So if he, if he wants to bless you, but you got to be on the other side of the Jordan, then you better get to the other side of the Jordan and don't cry to God when your blessing doesn't come because you were being disobedient. And we have people here that are getting their tails handed to them by the giant because God is saying you're out of position, you're not in the right place at the right time, you're not listening to me, you're not walking in faith, you're not taking a hold of my grace, and you're not confronting your giant, you're running from your giant. It's one thing to move because God is trying to position you, it's another thing to move because you're running away from your giants. Hmm. And it was at that very time where King Saul lost everything. And now you fast forward a couple of chapters and we see that he's confronting a Philistine army and they're standing at a place and the giant comes out. Some scholars say that he measured roughly about 13 feet. Others say as, as big as 15 to 16 feet. Either way, if you're bigger than 7 feet, I don't want to fight you. That's just me. But they said it's about 13 feet. It says that, that I believe it was his sword or his spear weighed roughly about 600 shekels. His sword weighed like 800 shekels and then his breastplate. I mean, it, it was just carrying a few hundred pounds on him. <laughs> and the story that really gets to me is that David goes out there with just the pastor's bag. I'm going to borrow my wife's purse. Baby, I'm going to borrow your purse, baby. Your purse, your, your cartera. Oh, I'll put some money in there for you. <laughs> His shepherd's bag. He went down and he put five smooth stones in the bag. He didn't take a sword. He didn't take a shield. He didn't take a javelin. And guess what? He didn't take somebody with him either. Today's shepherd's bag looks a little different. The shepherd's bag. When you go to battle with your giant, you don't need a sword. <laughs> you don't need a shield. You don't need a helmet. 
You don't need a walking buddy. You just need your shepherd's bag. And the giant comes. He, David says, you come against me with shield, sword, and javelin. But raggedy old me is coming with my shepherd's bag. You see, some of y'all are bringing the wrong tools to the battlefield. You're bringing your emotions. You're bringing your hurt. You're bringing your doubt. And God said, I just need you to bring the word. I, whenever you're facing your giant, you just need to reach into your shepherd's bag and just give them the word. Oh, y'all ain't, ain't following me. Y'all don't like this type of message because I, I, I'm not making you jump and shout. But let me give it to you this way. Jesus went into the wilderness and confronted the devil, and he didn't have a sword. He didn't have a shield, but he had the word. The word. He had the word. He defeated the giant of all giants with the word. So all you need is your shepherd's bag and just grab that verse and let them know I'm more than a conqueror. I'm the head and not the tail. You just need your shepherd's bag. You just need your shepherd's bag, sister. See, see, but the problem, sister, people are saying amen, but when the giant shows up, <laughs> some of y'all don't even know where your Bible is right now. <laughs> I, well, I can tell you where it's at. It's on the coffee table at Psalms 23 or Psalms 91, opened up, collecting dust. See, there's some dusty Christians in this house. They have so much dust in their life that they've forgotten the word of God. And God is telling you it's time to dust yourself off, get your shepherd's bag ready, and confront the giants in your life. Tell, the, tell your neighbor, don't be a dusty Christian. <laughs> you guys know what a dusty Christian is? You know that Christian that's in church, right? They look good, they dress good, they sing good. They praise good, they speak in tongues, they jump around, they run around in church. But when the battle comes, they're not in church. They stay home. When, 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 when the battle comes, they blame everybody. They don't, they don't take responsibility for themselves. Those are some dusty Christians because when you are a true Christian, whatever the battle is, you got your shepherd's bag and you confront that giant face to face. And you're like, giant, go ahead. You can talk about my God. You can talk about me. But when you're done opening your mouth, I got some rocks to throw. <laughs> Some rocks to throw. I'm almost done. But, but, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm lying. I'm lying. I'm not, I'm not sure at all. I'm not, I'm not done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I repent. I repent. I repent. Right? But, but, you see, the thing is, every time I think I'm done, it's like God just sends a message through email, right? And, 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 and I just gotta, I gotta share this with you because it's interesting to me that that, that he picked up five, but this is the key, smooth stones. Y'all missed it. Y'all don't understand it. Let me sit down to explain this. In order for a stone, I'm doing it like my daughter. My daughter be like, Dad, let me tell you something. Right? I feel like I'm my daughter right now. In order for a stone to be smooth, it has to go in the water, and the currents of the water will, will take it to where it bumps against other stones. Let's see if you guys catch this or not. If y'all don't catch it, y'all need to go home. <laughs> but the reason that you have so many issues in church is because the Bible declares that just as iron sharpens irons, ha, man sharpens man. So the person that's been getting on your nerve in church is there to take some of those sharp corners off of you because God needs to smooth out some things in your life. Because if you throw a rock that's not smooth, the trajectory will never be accurate. And he takes a rock 
and the rock goes through the water. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, the water's the word. <laughs> Takes it through the water. What's the water? The word. And the rock bumps into other rocks. Those are the people in your life. So God will use the water to cause you to bump into some people in your life. And those people are not there to get on your nerves. Those people are there to teach you. Those people are there to mold you. Those people are there to humble you. Those people are there to sharpen you. And he grabs the five smooth stones. In other words, he didn't grab a pointy stone. See, because... Pointed or jagged stones are good for cutting. Huh. But they're not accurate. That's why I could take a jagged stone and throw it and then take a baseball and throw it and I'm going to be more accurate with the baseball because the baseball will glide and no matter what's against the baseball because it's smooth, its trajectory stays on target. But if you're jagged, a little bit of wind will throw you off course. I didn't get that. There's Christians that are so jagged that a little bit of problems will take them off course. And God says, if you're getting off course all the time, it's because there's some things in your life that I got to smooth out and you can't face your giant until I deal with your jagged edges. Have you ever tried to skip a jagged water? It sinks. You take a smooth rock and you throw it across the water. It skips. Look at it this way. Smooth operator in Christ. It don't matter what the devil throws at you, it's going to bounce right off. But we have so many jagged Christians in the church that they get offended by pettiness. I put it on my Facebook post the other day. Petty Christians. Hmm. He grabbed five smooth stones. In other words, he grabbed something that has been through the process. You can't kill giants unless you've been through the process. Because instead of you grabbing your shepherd's bag, you grab your cell phone. 1-800-COMPLAIN-A-LOT. <laughs> sister, let me tell you about the sister. Let me tell you what the pastor did. Let me tell you about Pastor Jeffrey thinking he can do what he wants to do and he's the new man in the church. Let me, let, me, let me just tell you about what's wrong at Potter's house instead of telling you the greatness of what God has done in Potter's house. You see, that's the difference between a smooth stone and a jagged stone. The jagged stone will tell you everything that's wrong at Potter's house. The smooth stone will tell you the glory of God has saved people's lives at Potter's house. The smooth stone will tell you that the word of God is preached and has lifted up dry bones and has given them new life. The smooth stone goes and faces the giant while the jagged stone runs away. This is getting good. But there's another thing that really bothers me. He grabbed five stones. And yes, I told you, five stones. Number five is grace. But he only used one. He only used one, sister, but he had five. I had somebody tell me the reason he grabbed five is because I had, I had different stories. And the first one was, oh, he grabbed five because one was for Goliath and the other four were for his brothers. I'm like, okay. And the other one was like, well, he had five just in case he missed the first time. <laughs> That's a jagged Christian, by the way. Uh -oh, oh, you don't know about those type of Christians? Can I, can I tell you about those jagged Christians? See, those are the jagged Christians that says, well, pastor, it's not going to work because we already tried it. Come on. 
Oh, oh, well, Pastor, we can't do that. We did that 500 times, and, and, and I think we should do it this way. See, that's the problem. You have a sow mentality. You want me to do things with your armor when I don't need your armor. I already have God's armor, and I have enough stones. Hmm. You know, you have those, those Christians, you know, they want to put doubt. They're like his brother. You know, it's like, we're just a kid. Sister, you have a broken foot. What do you mean you're going to fight the devil? You can't fight no devil with a broken foot. Huh. That's David's response. You see, everybody else would say she can't fight with a broken foot. But David said, it. you see, what you don't know is I don't need good legs to fight my giant. Hmm. Hmm. It's funny because David tells his problem what his problem said. Have you guys noticed that? When was the last time you told the devil that you told your giant what they told you? Just a reminder. Well, you said that my God, and you defiled my God, but I'm here to tell you that because of what you said, my God is getting ready to kick you in the behind. You come against me. But not only that, the part that I really love, Sister Orga, is that he tells the giant what he's getting ready to do for him. That's some confidence right there. He was talking smack. David was a smack talker. He backed it up, though. Yeah, he did, but still, listen, let me tell you something. Let's be truthful. If a giant came through there and he looked like Goliath, I'm not going to be like, yeah, I'm about to do this to you, and I'm about to do that to you. But David said, come on, giant, come with your sword, come with your shield, come with your armor bearer, come with this, come with your army, because what I'm getting ready to do for you is this, not only am I going to take my rock and throw it in your face, after you fall down, I'm going to take your sword, the one you wanted to use against me, I'm going to use against you. I'm going to take your head as evidence of your defeat. That's why the scripture says that what the devil meant for bad, God will use for good. You see, and this is the thing, if you read the story, I didn't catch this until this morning. It said that David took the armor and put it in his, in his tent. He took the giant's armor and put it in his tent and said, nope, the head is good enough. Here you go. Here you go. You want the head? I don't know why he took the armor because it doesn't say. But me, I would say that he took the armor to remind himself every time he got discouraged because it wouldn't be the last giant that he had to face in his life. And sometimes you got to remember your past victories so that you can face your present victories. Sometimes you got to remind yourself from where God took you out of so that you know that you may have another giant just as big as Goliath, but you can defeat him just like you defeated the last giant. Maybe you won't defeat him with a rock, but you'll defeat him anyhow. Facing your giants. He had five rocks, but he only used one. If I, had a, if I had a gun and I had to face a giant, I'm not shooting him once. I'm going to make sure he's dead. <laughs> like dead, dead. Like dead, dead, dead. Like reload, boom, 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 make sure he's dead, dead. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but David used... One rock. Now, this is the part that intrigues me. He only used one because you only have one God. <laughs> and you only need one God to be faithful. You see, the Philistines believed in multiple, but he believed in one. And the very one he defiled was the very one that knocked them on his face. Here's the other thing. There is something that goes against the laws of physics here. Because, Brother Scott, if I was to throw a rock at your head and it hits you, which way you go? 
The Bible declares he fell on his face. Hmm. Hmm. Y'all don't see it, do you? you, you y'all don't, maybe I'm, I'm preaching over their heads, Manny. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. But, but if, I was to, if I was to shoot you in your head, you wouldn't, your head wouldn't come forward. It would go backwards. Goliath got shot in the head and he fell forward. doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> but after he got done defiling God, the very God he was defiling, he had to praise in his death. Every knee shall bow. Your giants will have to bow. And you need to understand, he was brave enough to cuss God. And God was God enough to say in death you will worship the very ground that I'm you need to understand that that which came against you will eventually have its turn before the king and it will have to bow and it will have to recognize the God of Isaac the God of Abraham the God of Ishmael the God of David, and the God of Potter's house. Amen. It will have to recognize. But you have to run to your giant. Amen. Not away. And I'm here to tell you today as I'm closing that you need to stop running. Because as long as you start, you keep running from what God has told you to do, you will be like Jonah in the belly of the whale. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be having no Jonah experience. Because Jonah was told to go to Nineveh. And he ran away. But even in his running away, he had to recognize he was disobedient from God. And they threw him over the ship. And the Bible says that a great fish came and swallowed him up. And for three days he was in the belly of the fish. All because he ran away. So he was in a situation. Where he ran away from God. And God had to use a fish. To spit him up on the coastlands of Nineveh. <laughs> Some of you are running away from God and the hell that you're going through is caused by your disobedience and God is giving you hell so that you can go back to do and fulfill what he has told you to do. God didn't tell you to go to Florida when he told you to go to Phoenix City. And if you're in Florida, but your job is in Phoenix City, you're going to catch hell in Florida so that you come back to Phoenix City and do what he has called you to do. But you're facing a giant. And you still have not captured that God's grace is sufficient. Faith does not mean that you won't have a moment of turbulence. Faith is like being on an airplane that has turbulence, but you have, a tr you have your trust on the pilot to get you out of it. And that's the same thing that happens in your life. That when you face the giant, it's like facing turbulence. But you have enough faith and understand that God's grace is sufficient. That he is the pilot. 
He is the author of your life, and he knows your beginning from your ending. He knows your middle from your ending. He knows the halfway point from your ending. He knows the somewhat halfway point from your ending. He knows every step that you're taking, but you have to have faith here because God already has you over there. But before he brings you over there, you have to face your giants over here, and none of you will get the promise that God has promised you if you don't face your giant because you have to defeat the giant in order to come to your promise. What's your giant? What is the giant in your life? What giant has caused you to sit down and not serve God in church? Ask yourself that question. What giant has caused you to not give God 100% of you? You see, why are you taking me there, God? But I'm going to go. You need to understand something. Some of you will never beat the giant because you're more concerned about the praise that you're going to get versus the victory that you're going to get through God. Y'all don't understand. Some of you are more concerned about how you're going to look versus being obedient to what has, God has called you to be. You see, we talked about this yesterday. When you are called, you don't look for honor. You honor God. When you are called, you will fight the giant understanding that all glory, even though he used you, you were simply a tool in God's hands. And the giant fell not because you threw the rock, but because God was the creator of the rock that guided the rock to the forehead of the devil. So it wasn't about you. We have people that says, oh, God used me to bless this brother. Let me tell you something. And this word is in the Bible, so it's not a bad word. Just in case. God used an ass to talk to a prophet. That doesn't make that ass more anointed. Thank you, sister. God, she got it. The sister got it. Do not think that because, let me use the proper word, right? I use the word that's in the Bible, so don't get upset with me. You can look it up. It's there, right? But I'll use a word that you may know. God used a donkey. He used a donkey to stop a prophet that was getting ready to curse the nation of Israel. And instead of uh, cursing, he blessed them. So don't think that you're special because God used you for something because God can use anyone at any time, at any place. If he can use a drunk lady to tell me you need to leave this bar because this is not for you and God is not done for you yet, then he can use a donkey like he can use an ass like he can use the person on the corner. Yes, sir. Amen. That's it. But you're never going to win your battles if you're more concerned about the praise of the people than your concern with defeating that giant. Your identity is connected to defeating your giant. Oh. Listen, I feel like running right now. Y'all have no idea how much I want to run right now and bring back some of that old school Pentecostal. I just want to run right now. But what you don't understand is that the giant that David faced connected him to the destiny to make him known in a kingdom that he was getting ready to take over and lead and unite and defeat the rest of the giants. Woo, Jesus, y'all don't know. I'm going to say because I'm chubby that I'm not going to run. But. <laughs> Woo! but see, the melody, people don't understand that. The giant he defeated changed the praise of the people. 
they would sing, Saul killed a thousand, but David killed 10,000. And when the enemy sees you coming, they're like, wait a minute, here comes a member of Potter's House Church. The other church killed a thousand, but Potter's House knows how to praise God, so they kill 10,000. A giant, listen, this is the thing. King Saul was so jealous, he said, I'll let you marry my daughter. I don't need your money, but I need you to kill a hundred more Philistines and bring me their foreskins. <laughs> if you don't know what foreskin is, just get with me after class and I'll tell you what that is. But let me just tell you, it's not a good thing. It's a humbling thing. Because, see, the plan of the devil was, oh, I'll give you my wife. I mean, I'll give you a wife. But you got to go with faith. See, Saul was hoping, because it says that Saul recognized the wisdom of David and became concerned with his wisdom. We were just talking about wisdom. You see, wisdom will give you the ability to strategically overcome any obstacles the devil puts in front of you. And when people lack wisdom, they become jealous of what you have because they feel entitled that they should have what God has given you. But the reason God hasn't given it to you is because you haven't taken your time to be alone with God in the pasture. And he says not only did he kill 100, he killed 200. He said, here you go. Here's 200 foreskins for your highness. And he dropped the mic. Think about that, Sister Melody. You see, because the devil will come to you and be like, okay, yeah, you knocked out one of my soldiers, but can you knock down a hundred? And your answer should be, yes, I can. You see, because the devil forgot something. The devil forgot, and some of us have forgotten, that when he comes against you, he's not coming against you. He's coming against God. And as long as you have God in your life and God is in your camp, that you have more than enough, you have more than sufficient, you don't need 200 men, you don't need 400 men, you don't need your sister or your brother. You just need God to fight your giants. You need God to overcome whatever it is that you're going through. I'm preaching good today. You see, what you don't understand is that God is the giant killer. You thought it was David. You thought it was David. And we preach about David all the time, how David killed God. But David said, my God, my God shall. He didn't say, I, David. He said, my God. God is a giant killer. And if you're running away from your giant, I will question your God. Because when you have God in your life, you shouldn't be running from the giant because God is with you like a mighty giant. He destroys giants. He eats giants for lunch, for breakfast, and for dinner. And if you keep on going long enough, he will eat them for dessert too. Because God is a giant killer. But you have to have him in your life. Tell the person next to you, stop running from God. You see, can I tell you something? I promise I'll quit. I'm trying so hard. I'm, I promise I'll quit, okay? I just told you, stop running from God. But I also told you, stop running from your giant. Let's see if you catch this. The reason I say stop running from God it's because God has already defeated your giant. So he's already where the giant's at. He's just waiting for you to catch up. You see, you need to understand that when you run away from your giant, you're running away from God. But when you're running to the giant, you're running to God by faith. You become a conqueror. You become more than a prince of peace. You become the victor at that time because you decided, I'm going to run to where God told me he will be. He said he will be with me in the furnace. He said he would be with me in the lion's den. So he's going to be with me on the battlefield as well. That's a revelation by itself, or illumination, better said. 
running from the devil, you're running from God because God has already defeated him. And God is just waiting for you to run to him so he can show you the victory that you already have. You just have to be bold enough to run in the direction of the giants instead of away from the giants. Let's give the Lord a hand clap this morning. I'm finishing up. I said 20 minutes ago I was done, and Sister Leslie said, are you sure? I'm sure now. Let's stand to our feet. Let's give God praise. I enjoyed myself this morning. I don't know about you, but I really did. I haven't sweated and been out of breath preaching in a long time. You see, I didn't run in the physical, but God made me run in the spirit. But I just thank God, and I want you to thank God. And if you are battling right now, I ask you to run to the altar and give your burdens to God because his burdens are light. And he is more than enough to be your king. God is a giant killer. And as long as you have God with you, you will defeat the giants in your life. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I just give you praise and glory. Man, you're such a good God, Lord. I don't know what it is about today, but I just felt you differently today, Lord. And I just thank you because you're just so real. You're, you're more than I can express with words. God, I love you and I thank you and I exalt you. I thank you for every person you have brought to this church. I thank you for my pastor that's provided guidance. I thank you for my wife and I just thank you for all that you continue to do. I thank you, Father Lord God, because you pushed me to face the giant. That no matter how scared I was to face the giant, you reminded me that you were with me, that you already gave me victory. I just have to walk the footsteps. I just have to walk and do as the scripture tells me, that your, that your word is a light unto my footsteps and, and that you would guide me, that, that I would walk through the valley of shadow of death, but that you will prepare a table before my enemies. I thank you for reminding me that I got to fight and defeat the giants through you so that I can sit at that table. And I pray for every member of this church, every person that's here, every guest. I pray for those, Father Lord God, that are going to be here. I pray for every empty area of pews and seats because I know you have names designated there already. For those that are going to come from the north, they're going to come from the south, they're going to come from the east, they're going to come from the west, they're going to come from other places, Father, and they're going to come in this house. And Potter's house will be called a church that serves you, that defeats giants because they serve the real living God. We glorify you, Lord. And we ask that you be with us this week. Be with the Spanish church. Be with, the, with Pastor Israel in the Spanish church. May the blessing be as great or greater than it was this morning here. And that you may be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you. God be with you. Let's give the Lord a quick hand of, a hand of applause. I love you all in the love of Christ. Let's continue to be faithful to God. Let's continue to look for God. And remember to invite somebody. Invite a friend, a co-worker to church.